In today's news, we look at three states with rapidly changing laws that affect the lives of transgender Americans. Utah moves one step closer to erasing transgender people. West Virginia bills declare transgender existence obscene. And Idaho's trans health care ban remains blocked. First, Utah Governor Spencer Cox has signed a law banning transgender people from using gender-affirming bathrooms in government-owned buildings. By John Riley, February 1, 2024. Utah Republican Governor Spencer Cox signed a bill into law that bans most transgender people from using bathrooms in government-owned buildings. Under the bill, Transgender people may only use bathrooms or changing rooms defined to include locker rooms, showers, and dressing rooms that match their assigned sex at birth. There is an exemption for transgender people who prove, through documentation, that they have undergone gender confirmation surgery and had the gender marker on their birth certificates amended. Adults accused of entering facilities designated for a gender that does not match their assigned sex at birth can be prosecuted for criminal trespass, which carries a punishment of up to six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. Those convicted of committing more serious offenses, such as loitering, lewdness, or voyeurism, while in a bathroom designated for the opposite sex can be punished with up to a year in jail and a $2,500 fine. Under the law, trans youth in public schools are restricted to using bathrooms, shower rooms, and locker rooms that align with their assigned sex at birth, although schools are required to create a privacy plan for students who do not feel comfortable using multi-user bathrooms due to their gender identity or fear being bullied or harassed by fellow students. The law does not impose criminal penalties for transgender youth who violate restrictions on bathroom usage, although school administrators would likely face scrutiny for failing to enforce sex segregation policies. The bill requires new government buildings to have single-occupancy bathrooms that transgender individuals would be permitted to use. However, the existence of single-occupancy facilities does not negate the necessity for multi-user facilities that are segregated based on biological sex. Additionally, any government institutions that do not enforce the rules or maintain sex-segregated facilities can face fines for failing to enforce the law and any alleged violations will be investigated by the state auditor. We want public facilities that are safe and accommodating for everyone and this bill increases privacy protections for all, Cox said in a statement after signing the bill, which took effect immediately. Supporters of the law have claimed its passage was necessary to prevent male predators seeking to harm women and children from entering female-designated spaces by claiming to be transgender women. Let's be clear, sexual assault knows no boundaries. Keeping men from women's spaces is an appropriate and much-needed boundary in Utah and across America, State Representative Kara Berkland, Republican, for Morgan, the bill sponsor, wrote in a post on X, nobody is calling out the transgender community for crimes against women. LGBTQ advocates say the bill is not only discriminatory, but will empower individuals to report others to law enforcement, potentially leading to false accusations against cisgender women who fail to conform to stereotypical gender norms in terms of dress and appearance. While the bill does have provisions that claim to punish people who serially make false reports of trespassing, critics of the law argue that those provisions may not be enforced by local prosecutors with anti-transgender animus. The law, is not going to protect people who may be trans or who may be masculine presenting or feminine presenting, warned Salt Lake County District Attorney Sim Gill, an opponent of the law, according to Axios. Not content to focus on bathroom or locker room use alone, the Republican-backed bill purports to bolster protections guaranteed under the federal Title IX law by ensuring that single-sex female sports teams receive nearly equitable funding and are granted equal access to athletic facilities, as their male peers. However, without expressly saying so, the bill also indirectly champions banning transgender athletes from female sports teams, arguing that the state has an interest in keeping sports teams segregated on the basis of biological sex. Cox previously vetoed a law banning transgender athletes from female sports teams, only to have the Republican-dominated legislature override his veto. That law was subsequently challenged in court, and has been blocked from being enforced by a federal judge. Perhaps most troublingly, the newly approved bathroom ban law also contains provisions that clearly define various gender-specific terms, such as female, male, mother, or father, as being based on a person's biological reproductive system. 
Critics argue that this constitutes erasure of transgender people from legal statutes, and will be used as justification for pushing other laws aimed at restricting transgender visibility in the future. The law's enactment makes Utah the tenth state to push through some form of restriction on transgender bathroom usage, though most states' bans primarily focus on students in K-12 schools. Utah becomes only the second state, after Florida, to ban adults from bathrooms in all schools, colleges, and government-owned buildings and set up potential criminal penalties for using facilities that don't match their assigned sex at birth. The law is the first piece of legislation this year targeting transgender restroom use, according to the Human Rights Campaign, which denounced the bill's passage. This bill is an invasion of the privacy of Utahns, HRC President Kelly Robinson said in a statement. No student should be denied access to the bathroom that aligns with who they are. No one should fear harassment in the most private of settings. Period. Next, a pair of bills in West Virginia would declare public displays of gender nonconformity obscene and bars access to not only gender-affirming medical care, but mental health therapy that affirms a person's transgender identity, by John Riley, on January 23, 2024. Introduced by West Virginia State Senator Michael Azinger, Republican for Vienna, the bill seek to target both drag queens and transgender people, with particular emphasis on the latter group, based on the idea that adhering to standards of dress and behavior that don't match one's assigned sex at birth, or fail to conform to traditional gender stereotypes, is inherently problematic and harmful to children. The first bill, SB 195, defines performing in drag or performing while existing as transgender to be obscene matter or sexually explicit conduct. Additionally, performing as a drag queen or a transgender individual in a place where a minor is present is defined as a form of indecent exposure. An individual who violates that provision can be jailed for up to six months and fined $1,000. Any venue that allows a minor to be present during a display of gender nonconformity can be fined $500. The bill also declares that any transvestite and or transgender exposure, performances, or display where it might be viewed by minors violates the law's prohibition on obscene matter or sexually explicit conduct. Under the proposed law, the penalty for sexually explicit conduct is a $2,500 fine and up to a year in jail for the first offense, a fine of $5,000 and a minimum of 6 months up to 12 months in prison for a second offense and a fine of $7,500 and from 1 to 5 years in prison for any subsequent violations. WVSB 195 is presented as a drag ban, but it becomes clear that its true aim is to prohibit the public presence of trans folks. Ash Orr, a transgender activist in West Virginia, wrote in a post on X, the language used in this bill categorizes anything related to trans individuals as obscene material and could lead to a felony charge. The bill also prohibits adults from showing a minor any films, pictures, graphics, magazines, or written material that include transgender people. Another Azinger bill, SB 194, would prohibit transgender individuals from accessing gender-affirming care until age 21, effectively expanding the state's existing ban on transition-related health treatments for minors into adulthood. The bill defines being transgender as a sexual deviation, similar to pedophilia, exhibitionism, masochism, sadomasochism or fetishism, reports transgender journalist Erin Reed on her Erin in the Morning substack. Under the bill's provisions, any medical provider who prescribes gender-affirming treatments could be subjected to a fine of $10,000 and have their license to practice revoked. SB 195 would also not only permit conversion therapy for LGBTQ-identifying individuals, but would essentially mandate that all mental health therapists engage in it. Under the bill, any therapist who affirms a transgender person's gender identity or encourages self-identification without intending to cure their gender dysphoria can be accused of unprofessional conduct, leading to them being disciplined by their certifying board and having their license to practice revoked. Therapists who affirm transgender identity can also be fined $5,000 per violation and will be prohibited from being employed by any local or state board of education, private school, daycare, charter school, or other academic institution as a counselor or other form of employment. It would also deny them retirement benefits if they are ruled to have violated the law. Trans people know they are, there is nothing to cure, or said to read about the conversion therapy mandate. The truth is, trans people of all ages are living happy, complete, 
and joyful lives, this contradicts the false narrative created around our community by extremist politicians. This piece of legislation attacks our most basic values of privacy and control over our own bodies, and is based on misleading or even outright false ideas. Critics of the bill note that there is ample evidence suggesting that conversion therapy, which is banned in 27 states, exacerbates feelings of gender dysphoria, as well as feelings of loneliness, depression, and suicidal ideation. Transgender people who have been subjected to conversion therapy are more than twice as likely to attempt suicide, and four times as likely to attempt suicide if subjected to conversion therapy as minors, according to a 2019 study. Azinger also introduced a third bill, targeting drag performances, specifically. Under that bill, adult cabaret performances, defined as any act featuring topless dancers, go-go dancers, exotic dancers, strippers, male or female impersonators who provide entertainment that appeals to the prurient interest, would be banned in public and in spaces where they might be viewed by minors. First-time violators of the law would be prosecuted for a misdemeanor, with subsequent violations prosecuted as felonies. Those convicted of a felony, which appears to include performers or owners of an establishment hosting the performance, could be fined up to $25,000 or subjected to up to five years in prison. Still, a fourth bill introduced by Azinger, SB 197, appears to be aimed at preventing schools from hosting Drag Queen Story Hour events where drag queens read books aloud. But as Truthout reports, the bill is worded more vaguely, leading some to fear that it could be weaponized to prosecute transgender individuals who live authentically according to their gender identity. Under the bill, obscene material, defined in a way that would include whether transgender and gender nonconforming individuals are present, is barred from schools. As such, depending on how the law is interpreted and enforced, a trans person who appears within 2,500 feet of a public school could find themselves prosecuted. Additionally, any faculty or staff allowing a trans person within that 2,500-foot area could be prosecuted and penalized with a fine of $500 and jailed for up to a year. The mere introduction of these bills conveys a message to trans West Virginians that our elected officials are aiming to dehumanize and erase our existence, or wrote in a post on X. Finally, the Ninth U.S. Circuit refuses to overturn judges' order blocking state officials from prosecuting doctors who treat transgender youth. By John Riley, on February 1, 2024, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals has refused to stay a lower court's preliminary injunction blocking Idaho from enforcing its ban on gender-affirming care for minors. On January 30, a three-judge panel of the appellate court rejected the state's appeal of Judge B. Lynn Windmill's December 26 order, which blocks state officials from prosecuting or revoking the licenses of doctors who treat transgender patients. The law, known as HB 71, signed by Republican Governor Brad Little last year, prohibits doctors from prescribing treatments that assist in a gender transition, such as puberty blockers, hormone replacement therapy, or gender confirmation surgery, to anyone under the age of 18. Doctors who violate the law can be subjected to fines of up to $5,000, risk the revocation of their medical license, and be convicted of a felony, which would earn them a prison sentence of up to 10 years. The American Civil Liberties Union and two families of transgender youth going by the pseudonyms Pam Poe and Jane Doe sued to block the law, arguing it is unconstitutional. After hearing the plaintiff's arguments, Windmill issued the injunction to block enforcement of the law while the case worked its way through the legal system. In his ruling, issued just days before the law was to take effect on January 1st, Windmill found that the families of the trans youth were likely to prevail in proving the law to be discriminatory and unconstitutional. He also expressed skepticism about the arguments the law's proponents put forth about the law's necessity. The state's goal in passing, the challenged act, was not to ban a treatment. It was to ban an outcome that the state deems undesirable, Windmill wrote. Idaho Attorney General Roel Labrador subsequently filed a motion asking the court to lift the injunction while he appealed Windmill's decision to the Ninth Circuit. But on January 16, Windmill rejected Labrador's request to stay his order and allow the law's provisions to take effect. With the appeals court's decision, Windmill's injunction remains intact and the youth plaintiffs in the case, who had already begun gender-affirming treatments, can continue to receive that care and will continue to do so until either a higher court reverses Windmill's decision or the law is struck down or upheld on its merits. 
Lawyers for the plaintiff celebrated the decision, leaving the status quo in place, at least for now. This ruling should be celebrated by everyone who decries discrimination, Paul Carlos Southwick, the legal director of the ACLU of Idaho, said in a statement. We celebrate alongside transgender youth and their families throughout Idaho who will continue to have access to the health care they need and deserve. Thank you for listening. If you appreciate the importance of stories like these, please like, share and subscribe for more updates. And visit us at metroweekly.com anytime.